Hi, good afternoon, everyone, uh, or good morning if you're listening to us in the UK or uh, in Europe. And welcome to this very special uh, webinar that we have for you today uh, on how can monetary and financial policies support sustainability goals in Asia through the recovery and beyond. Um, we've got a very strong uh, lineup of speakers today. Um, joining us here from Jessica Chu, who's the Deputy Governor of Bank Negara, Malaysia. Uh, we also have Yolanda Chung, Head of Sustainability Institutional Banking at DBS Bank. Um, and Ulrich Voltz, the Director of the SOAS Sustainable Finance Centre at SOAS University of London. Uh, my name is Aziz Durrani. I'm a Senior Financial Specialist at the CSUN Centre. Um, and I'll be chairing the session. So this uh, session, um, and this forms part of a series of events uh, following uh, the, the, the crisis response that are emanating from COVID-19. Uh, and the focus is really on how can these uh, responses be sustainable and support the climate risk uh, journey that we're on. It's part of a project that's led by E3G, the SOA Center for Sustainable Finance, the CSUN Center, and also the Bennett Institute for Public Policy uh, at the University of Cambridge. Uh, the, aim of the, the aim of the project is to examine the options that are gonna be available to monetary and financial authorities uh, so that they can respond to the current crisis in a way that's consistent with the national commitments to environmental and sustainability goals. We, we should also point out that the project is funded by the International Network for Sustainable financial policy insights, research, uh, and exchange, uh, also known as INSPIRE. Um, so without further ado, uh, let's kick off the session and I want to uh, introduce our first speaker. Bon Jessica Chu is currently the Deputy Governor at Bank Negara Malaysia. She has over 27 years of experience in the financial sector supervision and regulation within the banks, within the Bank Negara. Uh, she is currently responsible for financial stability, which covers the regulation and supervision of, of banks, insurance companies, payment systems, and money services. Jessica represents the bank as an advisor member of the Malaysian Accounting Standards Board and also holds a Chartered Banker qualification from the Chartered Bankers Institute in Scotland. She's also a fellow Chartered Banker of Asian Institute of Chartered Bankers and is an associate member of the CPA Australia. Uh, she graduated from the University of Melbourne, Australia, with a Bachelor of Commerce degree, majoring in accounting and finance. So, without further ado, DG Jessica, please uh, take it away and, and uh, give us your thoughts and comments on, on this very important topic. Thank you, um, Aziz. We're just trying to get the screen up. <laughs> All right, okay. Uh, I hope everyone can see the screen. Um, so I'm really delighted to be able to participate uh, in this webinar today to discuss how we can um, support environmental and sustainability goals uh, through monetary and financial sector policies. It's really quite an interesting time to be discussing this particular topic, um, particularly when a, a question that often gets asked is um, you know whether this is in fact the time to be focusing on environmental issues given the pressing and, and certainly significant challenges that are confronting our society and economies uh, as we deal with the impact from the COVID pandemic crisis. In fact, in, in many countries, the recovery process, and this includes Malaysia, is just beginning and considerable uncertainty still remains um, on, the, on the pace as well as the strength of that recovery. So to answer that question, I'd like to start by taking a look at how this crisis compares with past crises and its implications for environmental and sustainability outcomes. So I've just provided a quick chart here that um, across the, the bottom of the, the screen, um, it, it sets out three of uh, the major episodes of, of crisis in the recent past, the Asian financial crisis, the global financial crisis, and of course, um, the crisis that we are currently um, confronting. Now, policy responses to crisis do tend to have some commonalities. Um, at the bottom, the immediate concern is, is obviously with limiting the impact through monetary and fiscal responses, as well as um, balance sheet repair. 
and in particular balance sheet repair of financial institutions uh, when we're dealing with a financial crisis. But in, in other uh, circumstances, there is also balance sheet repair of corporates and households. So for episodes where we were confronted with a financial crisis, obviously this, this becomes a, a critical focal point um, to restore intermediation activities um, out of the financial system and to get credit flows flowing to the economy. So if you look further out uh, into the, beyond the immediate crisis resolution to the top of the chart that I have here, crisis episodes are usually also very often catalysts for reforms that seek to build longer term resilience against future crises. As um, the saying goes, never waste a good crisis. And I think this is um, typically the experience in any crisis there, is, it, it serves as a very powerful catalyst for reforms that need to take place. And we were certainly, um, that was certainly the case in the Asian financial crisis. Uh, in Malaysia's case, that was you know, the, the start of um, two master plans, uh, which incorporated many financial sector reforms that have since placed our financial system on a much stronger footing uh, than before. The, the thing that I do want to point out in this slide though, is that typically what we see is financial sector reforms and other structural reforms tend to proceed on parallel uh, paths, if you like. For example, and I'll give you the example of SMEs uh, in Malaysia. After the Asian financial crisis, we did many things to improve access to financing for SMEs. These are small and medium enterprises. And today they account for almost half of the business banking book uh, of, of banks in Malaysia. At the same time, however, SME contribution to growth remains relatively low if, if you compare across countries. Um, and that suggests that structural reforms uh, around for example, entrepreneurship, financial management, skills development uh, might still have some way to go. So the reason I have those two colors uh, across the top of the screen is because, you know, I, I do want to stress that many times these reforms tend to proceed um, separate from, from each other. Now, if we keep these perspectives in mind, this crisis presents some notable differences uh, in thinking about environmental and sustainability outcomes. First of all, the scale of monetary and fiscal responses has been unprecedented in many countries. Um, and we're talking about, uh, you know, in the order of trillions of dollars globally, and, it, and we're still counting. Malaysia's stimulus packages have cumulatively delivered um, close to 70 US dollars, uh, billion US dollars in support to the economy, and that represents about 20% of our GDP. Secondly, this has been both a demand and supply shock that has occurred simultaneously with nationwide lockdowns bringing economic activities to a sudden stop across the board and in some cases for longer than expected. Reports uh, have suggested that the pandemic is likely to have led to the largest reduction in global CO2 emissions to levels that we've not seen since 2006. The crisis is also likely to have accelerated changes in behavior under new norms that could have enduring effects on altering the course of actions uh, by individuals and businesses. And this will have direct implications for environmental and sustainability outcomes. Of course, these are early days and really to what extent that change uh, is entrenched and takes hold in different countries is yet to be seen. Examples are many companies deciding to maintain work from home arrangements, even after the easing of lockdowns. And of course, there's been uh, the, a notable acceleration in the adoption of digitalization. And last but not least, uh, the financial sector this time around has been far more resilient, unlike in previous crisis episodes, and has in itself been uh, a focal point in need of critical support as, as was observed in past crises. Now these factors provide a uh, once in a generation opportunity, and, and this is one way to look at it, to bring together both financial sector reforms and other structural reforms uh, needed to deliver sustainability and environmental goals. And in a way that is more integrated as countries start to chart their recovery paths from the pandemic crisis. So let me talk about what these opportunities are. First of all, an opportunity lies in the collective responses of individuals, businesses and financial institutions and governments to reset the course to a low carbon economy. 
Many businesses are rethinking their business models as they restart after the sudden stop. Online activities have become much more prevalent, both in social and commercial contexts. And these activities, as they proceed going forward, could actually determine the path towards a lower carbon economy. Secondly, the financial system this time is not in crisis and can play a pivotal role to support environmental and sustainability uh, goals through their lending and investment activities. And in this way, they can further reinforce efforts to shape a more sustainable recovery. Third, the scale of stimulus has also increased the stakes of ensuring maximum impact in terms of optimal social and economic outcomes with a longer term horizon in view. This is because fiscal space has become more limited and that this is going to be faced by many countries um, going forward. And finally, and certainly importantly, the physical and systemic nature of this pandemic shock also offer, offers opportunities to underscore why new norms need to be more sustainable to mitigate the devastation and economic scarring effects of a similar crisis in future. So I've just included a, a recent quote from Christina Georgieva of the IMF, um, who said that climate action may well be the silver bullet that we need at a time of low productivity and growth, low economic growth, low interest rates, and low inflation. And I think just today I was, I saw in the Financial Times, uh, Madame Lagarde has, is featured on the front page, also committing the ECB to greener changes in all aspects of its operations, including asset purchases. So is this the right time to be talking about environmental and sustainability uh, goals? I, I certainly think that you know, a strong and certainly compelling case can be made for it, and that is recognized um, globally, even in this period. So if I can move on, um, this slide simply points out really the obvious. Uh, that is, addressing environmental and sustainability challenges does require a collective response. Um, and I'm not going to go through the details of uh, what's on this slide. It is, however, I will say this, it is much easier to put this down on a slide than actually achieving it in practice. Um, you know, due to many tensions that, that exist uh, between economic agents, the government and, and other important stakeholders. So it, it does remain unfortunately true that a key challenge facing many economies, including Malaysia, is often one of having a joined up approach to tackling issues such as climate risks, for example. Um, having clear policies at the national level is absolutely critical, um, but also important for, for, for traction um, to be achieved is really having the framework and arrangements that must include accountability and incentive systems that are aligned with the outcomes that have been set. So without going into the details, I think this, this slide um, continues to present the, the vision for how economies uh, do need to come together to respond to the challenges involving environmental and sustainability issues. And that it is still for many countries um, a goal that that uh, remains in the future because much more work does need to be done to bring all these different actors together. Um, let me just close off uh, with uh, some observations on Bank Negara's response to climate risks. And uh, I'll talk through this, this chart uh, a little, in a little bit more detail uh, as we're discussing financial policies, uh, financial and monetary policies. Um, like most countries, Malaysia obviously has not been spared from an increasing frequency and intensity of climate events and their adverse effects on productivity, on output, and on social well-being. And we believe that in line with our statutory mandates of uh, financial and monetary stability, it is our responsibility to consider the implications that uh, these climate events and climate risks more broadly has on monetary policy settings, and to ensure in particular that financial institutions are adequately measuring, mitigating, and buffered against climate change risks. It is also our view that the financial sector can, and in fact should, play a catalytic role in the transition towards a low carbon economy. And this is because it's, it's very centrally placed in any economy between business, households, and government, and they control significant resources that, that, that fuel the economy. So, 
Beyond managing risks, uh, we believe that providing an enabling environment for green financing and investment activities is, is also something that uh, the central bank participates in and contributes to. So on this chart, I've just laid out the primary areas of focus around firstly strengthening climate risk management, secondly, encouraging policy alignment, and thirdly, ensuring that our own operations are consistent with improving sustainable outcomes. And in the boxes in the middle, uh, I've just set out some of the strategies that help to frame our uh, initiatives in the bank as we approach this challenge. Um, firstly, under climate risk management, uh, a lot of effort goes into engagement and capacity building. And um, this seems obvious, but really the intensity of uh, the work that needs to go into that has become for us um, eye-opening because there is a dearth of, of uh, data, uh, of experience and knowledge around uh, climate risk management, which remains a new field for uh, many institutions in this country and, and even for the central bank. Secondly, integrating climate risk in macroeconomic and financial stability assessments. So we are uh, uh, benefit greatly from become, being a member of the um, Network for Greening uh, the Financial System. And um, that work has helped us, is helping us to, to enhance our uh, macroeconomic framework, uh, macroeconomic and financial stability assessment frameworks. Um, and one of the things that uh, current work that is ongoing now is um, developing climate transition scenarios that can be uh, an input into how we look at um, points of stress uh, for our financial system. Uh, third is strengthening regulatory and supervisory expectations for managing climate risk. And uh, beginning you know, since uh, last year, we've, in, we've really ramped up the conversation with uh, financial institutions uh, in Malaysia around our expectations for managing climate risk. So this has become uh, integrated with our supervisory engagements with financial institutions. So in our annual cycle of um, climate risk, uh, sorry, of uh, risk assessments of financial institutions, we call it composite risk ratings that we, uh, where we, you know, discuss some of the issues of concern for supervisors around financial institutions. Climate risk management is now very much a part of that conversation. Um, and that is helping to focus the minds of uh, financial institutions, both the board as well as the management team on how they're managing climate risk. So we're trying to understand how financial institutions look at this and how they're incorporating climate risk considerations in their overall frameworks. Um, so across the, the right, I have kind of just put down a few things that we're working on. We have uh, recently uh, issued a discussion paper on uh, climate risk uh, a taxonomy and, and a it's a principle-based taxonomy and uh, this is an effort uh, to try and uh, classify, uh, provide classifications and identify risks within financial institutions books in terms of their exposures to climate risk. Um, that paper is available um, you know on our website uh, if you're interested and uh, we are we've received very good feedback and we are in the process of finalizing that uh, with a pilot uh, project underway to actually get some data uh, based on that taxonomy from financial institutions, which will give us a better sense. Our estimates now place uh, potential exposures of um, financial institution assets to climate risk at around between uh, around 11 percent, uh, and we'd like to you know get better data to refine that. Um, Supervisory expectations is something that uh, I spoke about earlier. Stress testing has been an area that uh, we, we are also working on as discussed. And uh, moving forward, we're encouraging financial institutions to adopt the TCFD uh, disclosures in, in reporting how they, they manage climate risk. In the second uh, frame, I've, around policy alignment, I think for us, this is about creating an enabling environment for green financing and investment. Uh, I'd just like to point out that one of the things that we've done since, uh, I believe it was September last year, was establish a joint committee on climate change. Um, and the idea is to uh, bring together representatives from the industry, the Central Bank, the Securities Commission, um, to, to move things forward on a number of fronts. Uh, there are four key work streams under this, one that looks at risk management, 
one that looks at governance, uh, one that looks at products and innovation and uh, engagement and, and capacity building. Um, and, you know, it's doing a lot of work across all four uh, work streams to um, enable us to move forward in terms of building the, the foundations and uh, uh, building blocks for us to be able to manage climate risk moving forward. Um, Value-based intermediation uh, is also something that has been uh, intensified in Malaysia since 2018. Uh, this, is, this started with um, the Islamic finance institutions in Malaysia and was very much aligned with Sharia uh, principles and tenets. And the idea behind that is, to, is for financial institutions to take account of uh, how their activities impact the, the environment and uh, the social um, conditions around them. And, um, you know, it sets out guidance around um, how decisions um, may be made to take these considerations into account, as well as measurement frameworks to measure the impact and outcome of lending and investment decisions. So we do see an important opportunity to mainstream this uh, VBI in the financial system and uh, to do that uh, in lockstep with our focus, increased focus on climate risk management. Um, sustainability focused funds are uh, funds that we have in Malaysia um, around green technology, financing, and I think in this crisis as well, um, the funds that are being set up to support SMEs and to provide relief, uh, increasingly we are also looking at how the design features of some of these funds can be pivoted also to incorporate sustainability considerations as businesses tap into these funds to restart um, and uh, their, their businesses. There is an incredible opportunity for us to look at how the, the funds can also be used to encourage moves towards more sustainable practices in businesses. Um, and finally, at the bottom, this is the bank's own operation. So uh, in our own uh, investments, uh, for example, our currency operations, as well as you know, the, the way we manage our facilities and day-to-day -day activities, um, we are taking uh, sustainability considerations and climate risk very seriously. And uh, we are building even internal frameworks for measuring the impact of our daily operations. Uh, on climate risk, and that is a process that is ongoing. So I, I just wanted to highlight that uh, the the shades in orange that you see on the on the slide uh, really point to areas where, in the context of the crisis that we're currently in, we have seen uh, from our own experience the opportunity to really accelerate the focus that, uh, on around climate risk and issues that surround that. Um, and these are areas where you know, in the current crisis, they, they are actually particularly relevant uh, in talking about how we can move forward to uh, move this agenda forward. So I'll leave this there uh, as is for now, and I'm happy to take questions uh, from participants. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gigi Jessica. And uh, that, that was a very uh, interesting presentation and really highlighted a lot of the difficulties that we're currently seeing because Clearly, you know, people are, people are struggling, they're losing their jobs, we're having a massive impact on the economy, uh, and there's a lot of pressure, and, and you kind of highlighted very clearly that kind of balance around, you know, people saying, well, can, can we really continue to get involved in this? And I think you brought out the reason that actually these kinds of, uh, you know, COVID-19 highlights the, how these kind of natural events can really throw off the economy, uh, and, and if we don't start acting now, you know, whatever it may be, pollution, we had haze here last year, it could be rising sea levels, they, they can really impact uh, economic growth and financial stability. So from, from just that perspective as well, it's, it's important to continue to, to engage on these issues. Uh, and it's certainly very, very good to see Bank Nagara taking such a leading stance in, in, in so many of these uh, uh, elements. So thank you for that. Um, we will take questions at the end and can I encourage uh, people to use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens to, to uh, engage with the debate and start sending in your questions and, and uh, observations that you may have. Uh, but now let's just move on to our next speaker. We've heard from the, from the central banking side and I think it'll be useful to now hear from the private sector side. So let me introduce uh, Ms. Yolanda Chung. Uh, she joined DBS in 2017 and is currently the head of sustainability of institutional banking group. She leads the bank's responsible financing framework 
and advisors on environmental and social issues pertaining to transactions. Yolanda was previously head of sustainable finance at Standard Chartered in London, where she established the bank's sustainable lending agenda. And before joining the banking sector, she was an equity analyst for the mining and building materials sector at Rebecca Sam in Zurich, Switzerland. She graduated with a Master of Science in Environmental Change and Management from Oxford University. So Yolanda, we're very pleased to welcome you here. Um, please take it away. Thank you. So I feel very privileged today to be able to uh, join the panel alongside Jessica. Um, and I know that Bank Negara Malaysia has been pioneering in many of the climate change risk management policies as just the taxonomy. Um, and I will go into a little bit more detail about the DPS taxonomy uh, that we try to um, uh, uh, emulate what Bank Negara has done. So for us, if we look at the next slide, The topic of today, we want to look at how the pandemic has changed businesses and how financial institutions, commercial banks like DPS is coping with um, the pandemic. Um, of course, uh, we do take our cue and guidance from our central banks uh, being based in Singapore, MAS also being a member of NGFS, the Network for Greening Financial Services. Uh, we have been involved in all the work streams that uh, Jessica has mentioned. So the team of uh, sustainable finance at DBS under our IBG Institutional Banking Group looks at both the risk management work whereas all the structuring and advisory for green finance transactions. So we do wear two hats and uh, with that uh, overview, we feel that if we look at the pandemic, um, we could summarize the disruption to our way of how how we used to work and how we used to think um, in the real economy. One is that our customers do face a very strained balance sheet. It could be falling revenue, rising costs, and the balance sheet is not as resilient as before. And to then look, talk about green recovery, actually we have to make a conscious effort. It is not something that is uh, uh, intuitive. Even though there is a lot of discussion and debate uh, that has gone on about uh, the importance of green recovery and actually how much financial and economic sense it makes to have a green recovery. But the reality is balance sheets are strained. The second disruption we've seen is in terms of capacity, the bandwidth the companies have and uh, they can't really afford the luxury of thinking beyond the medium term or even the short term. Many of them are really coping by the week. The third disruption is just the uh, this interruption that they face in the supply chain, in the logistics, in their employee product, in forecast and beyond because it is not as simple as before in making sales forecasts uh, and, and those projections have been thrown out of the window. So the question to ask, um, knowing that the pandemic has disrupted business as usual, and it may be a disruption of business as usual, the question is, has it scaled back companies' sustainability ambitions? Uh, the next slide. Let's look at some of the instruments that we use a lot at commercial banks when we try to do green finance, uh, which is green loans and sustainability linked loans. A very quick um, description of the mechanics of the two. Uh, even those some are used changeably, actually referring to two very different structures. Green loans uh, are loans that the entirety of the loan has to go to green projects, green assets, green purposes. And for sustainability link loans, these are loans that allow the borrowers to use the money for whatever working capital, other purposes they see fit. And very often these loans would come with a potential upside in terms of a margin discount in the interest payment that they make if they meet certain sustainability performance targets. So in a way, if we look at the statistics in the second half of this year, uh, which is the last column, uh, compared to the same time last year, 
we have seen a slight downward trend. And I would say that actually the decrease compared to the same time last is a lot less than I thought, um, because a lot of the loans have not materialized simply for credit reasons. And in our interactions with customers, we have not really encountered any reservations to try to tap into sustainable finance because of the pandemic. Um, as Jessica has said, I think actually a never waste a good crisis and companies are really trying to learn on the opportunities given uh, by this disruption to try to go digital and to try to understand how this may be a uh, foretaste of what climate change may bring in the future. So it's almost like a rehearsal, a major disruption that is uncertain and is uh, and, and the act stretches into the long term. Then on to the next slide. What I've shown on the slide here is about transition. And allow me uh, a couple of minutes to explain what this transition term means, because we talked about physical risk, transition risk under climate change a lot. And it refers in that context that transition risk would be policy changes or technological advances that would make certain business models um, redundant. The transition that I'm talking about here uh, in my presentation is to say that companies aiming or they should be aiming for net zero emissions by 2050, that pathway, that transition, how ready companies are by geography. If we look at Asia, other Asia, Japan, China and India, you would see that these are the parts of the world, majority of the customers are far from ready. Uh, they're not ready in terms of not having any climate disclosure. They're not ready in terms of even having uh, any uh, targets set uh, in the relatively rare instances that they have scope one, two, and three emissions disclosed and may even have set themselves targets. The targets are not exactly science-based targets to reach net zero by 2050 or to try to have emissions peak by 2030, which is the trajectory we want to arrive at when we say we want to be Paris Climate Agreement compliant. And given this context and the wider environment of the, what the pandemic has brought about, uh, DBS launched uh, last week uh, a sustainable and transition finance framework and taxonomy. So on to the next slide. What we've done is that we realize in Asia, in Southeast Asia in particular, where DPS operates and has our major press, many of our customers need a lot of um, encouragement and also uh, incentives provided by the commercial banks to move towards a low carbon economy. Uh, we do hope that we'll see more policy guidance and directives from our regulators and the government's concerned because we believe that is the most powerful uh, way to uh, encourage companies or to mandate companies to change. Given that may not come soon enough, as a commercial bank uh, at, at DBS, we feel that we have a responsibility to also play our part in incentivizing companies to do better. And rather than focusing on just the sustainable part of um, the taxonomy that you may have seen in the EU taxonomy, we want to take one step further to look at transition finance. These are companies in high impact, often fairly polluting sectors. So these could be steel production, cement production, it could be gas fire power generation, it could be shipping. So these are companies in sectors that will be considered to be in brown industries, as opposed to the green industries, such as renewable energy, mass transportation. 
And we feel that if we look at the green bond market so far, majority of the issuers and the underlying assets used for green bonds are coming from the usual suspects, meaning it could be renewables, it could be clean mass transportation, it could be uh, water waste management um, for municipals, but it hasn't really branched out and it has remained quite niche. And for the world to achieve two degrees, we need all hands on deck and transfinance is going to play a part in it. So what we've done is in the framework, we have effectively set out a list of economic activities and we label them either sustainable or, or, or green. Um, they could also be conducive to achieving UN Sustainable Development Goals, UN SDGs, or they could be considered in transition, meaning that they are in a brown industry, they're not trying to um, uh, greenwash their investors or stakeholders by calling labeling their assets green, but they are making an effort to make the transition. And we plan to use the framework to guide all our business origination and advisory for a whole range of products and services that we offer at the bank. Uh, next slide. So on to uh, the labels that we uh, use in the taxonomy. Um, for green and UN SDGs, um, I'm not going to uh, labor the point much because I think um, they are fairly well known uh, to many of people of the people in attendance. When it comes to transition, so here we know that uh, it is a contentious agenda. Um, many investors uh, and climate scientists believe that anything less than dark green should not attempt uh, to do sustainable finance because you would be accused of greenwashing or purpose washing because purpose is now the new um, fashionable term uh, companies use. What we want to make sure when we do transition finance is that the transaction the, the, the capital that is being used to facilitate certain activity, that activity needs to displace carbon intensive options that are being used at the moment in a very significant way. We also re require independent documentation and verification of that mitigation. We would also look at how that particular activity or technology that we are financing is enabling a wider application of less carbon intensive options. The uh, notable example here would be uh, in a country that is, um, that should really have a fuel mix that is as clean as possible, but in order to accept intermittent renewables, the grid upgrade also needs to happen. Yolanda, I think, I think we've just lost your, uh, your picture and your voice. I'm not sure if you can hear us. Uh, okay, I think we might have to move on. I, I was actually quite getting into that, um, and uh, I think it was coming to a, to a good conclusion. The the one thing that 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 was uh, kind of uh, striking out um, was was around you know the need to have um, the, the taxonomy fixed and you know green bond or green loan standards that uh, we can all um, or, 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 the, or the wider community community can can all uh, expect and use and right now there's a there's a variety of standards and so there's obviously uh, potential for some arbitrage around that so let's then uh, um, leave, leave it there with, with Yolanda and hopefully she'll be able to join us again for our Q&A part let me uh, move on and introduce our third speaker uh, Ulrich Volz who's the founding director of the Seller Center for Sustainable Finance uh, and a reader in economics at SOAS University of London. He is also a senior research fellow at the German Development Institute and honorary professor of economics at the University of Leipzig. 
He is a director of the Global Research Alliance for Sustainable Finance and Investment and serves on the Advisory Council, the Asian Development Bank Institute, and the board of Safinda, the Sustainable Finance Data Initiative. And I think, uh, Ulrich, you've had uh, experience across uh, teaching at many international universities. Uh, I won't go through the whole list, but uh, you've also spent stints working at the European Central Bank, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and held visiting positions at the University of Oxford, University of Birmingham, the ECB Bank Indonesia, and the Ayoma Gokin University in Tokyo. And you're part of the UN inquiry into the design of a sustainable financial system. So I think with that experience, uh, we're, we're really keen uh, to hear from your perspective and, and possibly bring together the kind of the central bank and the public sector side along with the, the private sector side and how we can move forward on the sustainable finance initiative. Thank you, Uli. Well, thank you, Aziz, and it's a great pleasure uh, to speak uh, on a panel with uh, Jessica and also Yolanda. And um, it, it's really uh, great to see how the discussion has changed. And I would very much like to, to uh, commend Jessica on her leadership uh, in, in driving the uh, sustainable finance agenda at uh, Bank Negara Malaysia. Um, I actually started my work on sustainable finance uh, very much uh, in Southeast Asia. So around a decade ago, I did a research project with Bank Indonesia on how to scale up green finance. And at the time, uh, it was very unusual for a central bank to, to uh, be interested in this topic. And indeed, um, I had many, many conversations with central bankers in Europe, but also Asia and elsewhere, uh, who were very irritated, uh, you know, that, that a central bank would be concerned about um, sustainability, uh, climate risk, and so on. And uh, it, it's so great to see how completely um, this discussion has changed. Um, uh, if you could move to the next slide, please. So turning uh, to the current environment, uh, we have once again central banks at the forefront uh, of fighting the crisis uh, supervisors have also uh, been playing an important role. Um, and both central banks and supervisors uh, have been playing uh, or making important contributions to, to stabilizing uh, the situation. Um, there was enormous turbulence in financial markets back in uh, March um, and April, and uh, central banks uh, and supervisors have, uh, with very pragmatic um, approaches help to cool the situation uh, and of course uh, also now uh, there will be important uh, contributions um, in, in the recovery and but it's very important um, to to make clear that the policies that are being adopted now will in many cases have very profound uh, implications on long-lasting outcomes and even though um, the responses are geared towards the very short-term needs, you know, creating employment, stabilizing markets, and so on. Um, uh, they need to be consistent with long-term climate and sustainability goals um, and help our overall transition uh, to low-carbon, sustainable economy. And uh, that should, of course, also happen in a, in a um, just way uh, so that um, poorer parts of the population are specifically supported in this. Um, please, next slide. So, um, of course, the, the prime concern has been um, stabilizing the economy, um, stopping the free fall of the economy, keeping jobs and so on. Um, and there have been a lot of liquidity enhancing stimulus measures um, easing of counter-cyclical and prudential instruments, and all this has been really important. Um, but it's also important to realize that there are risks involved in that. If uh, these liquidity-enhancing uh, measures and uh, easing of prudential instruments are not calibrated in a way that account for climate and other sustainability risks. So, there is concretely a danger uh, that kind of the, the uh, easing stimulus measures 
contribute to build up of new risk um, if these are not really uh, built in. So it's therefore very important that um, uh, in, in, the uh, in, in, in the different uh, responses that are implemented, uh, central banks and supervisors do consider uh, how can we address sustainability and climate concerns. Uh, next slide, please. And the good news is that actually a lot of monetary and prudential instruments can be calibrated in ways that account for climate or other sustainability related financial risks um, or uh, contribute um, in other ways to climate and sustainability goals. And just to give you a few examples, um, collateral frameworks of things that most people don't really uh, think about much, but uh, these uh, are very powerful tools and they can be adjusted to account for climate and sustain uh, sustainability related financial risks. So for example, uh, central banks can apply haircuts or exclude certain dirty assets that are not aligned with sustainability goals. Um, and this uh, can really have um, massive implications on the allocation of, of credit and investment. Um, refinancing operations can be aligned with sustainability goals. And I'm not only talking about climate, but also, uh, for example, and, and um, uh, Jessica mentioned uh, uh, SMEs, um, there can be special refinancing operations for SMEs, and, and this is something that has uh, been taken up quite a bit. Um, reserve requirements and risk weights can be differentiated to account for carbon footprints uh, or uh, other sustainability fa factors. Um, an increasing number of central banks now also among emerging economies, including in Asia, um, has implemented asset purchase programs um, when these involve corporate asset purchases, um, these, these also should uh, be aligned with climate goals and uh, carbon intensive assets uh, should be excluded. Um, and this is not green QE as such, uh, it's basically excluding dirty assets. Um, here is the um, kind of the shameless self-promotion uh, slide. Um, we recently published, uh, I wrote a paper with uh, uh, Simon Dickow and Nick Robbins from the LSE. Uh, and we published uh, this uh, toolbox report, uh, which basically provides an overview of all kinds of uh, instruments and tools that central banks and supervisors can use uh, to align their policy responses with sustainability and climate goals. And I think we do need um, uh, uh, this really, uh, this discussion uh, in the central banking supervisory community. Uh, but I would also like to say that uh, there have been indeed some um, uh, good moves. I mean, uh, if you look at the, the responses of central banks and supervisors, these have been all um, fairly kind of uh, standard responses. So in the sense that they have been not, not been integrating sustainability or climate risk considerations, uh, but they can be retrofitted. So moving uh, forward, uh, central bank supervisors can um, uh, take these into account. Uh, but we do have seen some, some good moves. Um, a number of central banks, including in um, East Asia, uh, have um, moved uh, um, ahead with the uh, sustainable finance agenda. Um, Jessica mentioned uh, the great work uh, uh, Bank Negara Malaysia has done. Uh, we've also seen, for example, in the Philippines, um, the central bank uh, approving a sustainable finance framework. Uh, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority in May, uh, together with the uh, Security and Futures Commission, launched a green and sustainable finance cross-agency steering group uh, to move the sustainable finance agenda ahead. Uh, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, as was mentioned, uh, is one of the founding members of the NGFS, um, launched um, last month a public consultation on a guide for environmental risk management, uh, and also a fintech challenge uh, for climate change. Um, and uh, the ASEAN uh, central banks uh, have also uh, worked closely on climate uh, issues and, and will be putting forward a, a report uh, on climate and other environmental risks soon. So uh, there clearly is a lot going on, uh, but it's also important to, to kind of 
uh, use all these different insights that have been gained um, to calibrate existing climate response uh, tools um, in accordance with climate and sustainability goals. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Julie. Uh, I think that uh, paints a very good picture of, of the work that's going on. Um, I think we now do have some time for Q&A, so can I invite the other panelists to also um, turn on their cameras and join us? Uh, and, and we can start going through uh, some of the issues that were raised. And for those uh, participants um, who are uh, dialed into this, please do use the Q&A box uh, at the bottom to, to send through your questions. Um, so I think there's a couple of um, particular questions actually for, for DG Jessica, but maybe before I come to those, there is, um, uh, there's one uh, kind of more broader one, which is talking about while we're resetting the carbon economy, who should take lead? Should it be developed uh, countries or emerging countries? Um, I think each of you will probably have a view on that. But, um, do, do you want to share your thoughts on, on who should be taking the lead on, on these? Maybe I'll start off with this. Uh, I, I do think that uh, emerging economies, I do think emerging economies um, do have to uh, own and drive uh, the, their own sustainability uh, agendas. And um, there is obviously opportunities to, uh, for collaboration at a national level with, you know, developed economies providing very important support to the efforts of emerging economies. But the reason I, I believe it is emerging economies to, to also take accountability for this agenda is because there are very unique issues and challenges that emerging economies do have to confront in uh, managing uh, a transition. Um, in many of our countries, uh, there are issues around um, growth, uh, poverty that need to be addressed and sometimes the um, actions uh, that are you know advocated by developed economies uh, do not sufficiently take into account these circumstances and I think the more emerging economies can um, you know uh, play a bigger role in, in influencing driving their own agendas I, I do think that uh, provides, uh, produces a more optimal outcome globally. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great point. And as we were saying earlier, a, a lot of these uh, immediate climate impacts are already affecting emerging economies di quite directly. So it's, it's, it is in fact very refreshing to see a number of actions being taken by uh, central banks uh, across Asia and you see some you know, members in, in dealing with a number of these things. So uh, Uli, what do you want to add to that? Yeah, I'll, I'd just like to, to add to that. Um, I think it's important to understand that it is a false choice between sustainability and growth. I mean, growth that is not sustainable uh, is, is not, or kind of development that is not sustainable is no real development. Yeah? Um, and uh, in particular, when we talk about climate change, uh, if we are, for example, in a region uh, like Southeast Asia, which is extremely vulnerable to the physical impacts of climate change, it's a no-brainer. I mean, the physical and transition impacts of climate change are going to be massive. Um, and a financial supervisor, central bank, that does not account for these risks is not doing their job. It's as simple as that. So um, the, the idea that, uh, well, you know, sustainable finance is maybe something that uh, advanced countries can, can uh, you know, afford to, to deal with. This is, this, is, this is not true. You know, this is really a universal agenda. And of course, there is no, no question that uh, in terms of climate policy, uh, there is an obligation by advanced countries who have been contributing the most historically to global warming, that they need to support uh, poorer countries in adaptation and, and mitigation uh, activities. But um, it, it's certainly in the very 
a, a strong self-interest of all countries, including uh, poorer ones, but also emerging economies, of course, um, to, to really uh, get this right and build the economy for the future. Thanks. Thanks, Ali. Um, let me just move on to the next question. And perhaps, Yolanda, this, this is one that uh, uh, you might want to start off on. Um, could you please elaborate on how these sustainable measures can be quantified and measured in the books of companies? So, for example, how do you really how do they really prove their investments are fruitful towards improving sustainability? And this is a really good question because it's at the moment it's it's as I was saying it's very hard to to prove it uh, conclusively. So, Yolanda, how how do you kind of tackle this this question? Oh, or have we lost the connection again? Yeah, I'm still here, but um, it's a little yeah. bit broken. So let me attempt. Hello. Yeah, it's it's you kind of fading Hello? in and out. We, we can hear you just about. Yes. Okay. Attempt uh, answering this question. So we. Okay, I think hopefully Yolanda will just try and uh, dial in again, and, and we can have, we can have a go at that. Um, do you, um, Uli or Jessica, do you want to do you want to uh, share any thoughts, or should we move on to the next question? Because there are a few for you, for each of you coming in as well. Yeah, m maybe you mentioned a couple of uh, questions, and then we can can because we're running a bit short of time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So really one for you is if, if we're ref retrofitting uh, some of the existing tools for climate and sustainable purposes, um, will it truly aid the greening of the financial system? Um, so again, this is, a, this is a bit, I think you were talking about how, how we can use some, some of the current tools we use. Will they actually deliver what they're supposed to? Uh, well, I mean, uh, so what one, one thing, that I would like to emphasize is that uh, different central banks have different frameworks. Financial markets don't look the same in every country. So uh, it is important to, to look which tools and instruments work best in which context. So it's not uh, one size fits all policies. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that um, climate change, uh, uh, central banks, uh, you know, should be the only game in town and, and that um, adjusting, say, the um, collateral framework uh, will do the magic trick and everything will be fine. Uh, but uh, finance or kind of financial supervision can be extremely powerful. So calibrating um, uh, uh, prudential instruments in a way and also monetary instruments in a way uh, that take account of climate risk can be ex extremely powerful. I would definitely uh, 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 contend that. So, um, uh, uh, and, and one thing that's also very, very important, and I think this cannot be underestimated, the importance of uh, leadership and signaling. Um, Jessica made uh, uh, that point in her presentation. The interaction with the financial system, um, the financial institutions that, that uh, uh, are being supervised, making clear what the expectations are, that this is not kind of an add-on, you know, it's a corporate social responsibility, issue, uh, but this is really um, uh, 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 an important issue that, that central bank supervisors take seriously. And, and so having some very clear sphere uh, from the supervisor is important. And I would also like to add that, um, of course, we are in the midst of a crisis. So this is a difficult time to introduce all kinds of new uh, regulations and so on. But what central banks and supervisors can do is give very clear signal to their markets and say, uh, we will be moving ahead with uh, uh, climate related financial disclosure. We will be moving ahead with, uh, with climate stress testing. We are not introducing it right now, but we are expecting you. Yeah? So kind of setting the, the framework, announcing you know, next year, uh, we will be starting to, to, to uh, uh, expect you to do climate stress testing. You know? um, yep. And, and this, this will uh, clearly affect current uh, behavior. So uh, financial institutions who are now considering to finance all kinds of uh, uh, climate problematic uh, projects, 
if they have this announcement, they will uh, uh, consider twice what they do. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Uli. Just um, let me just check. Y y Yolanda, are you, are you, are you, have you managed to connect in or are you still? Yeah, I'm back on, but uh, okay. apologies, I didn't finish the answer. <laughs> Uh, okay, yeah, I mean, it's just, um, we kind of missed, missed your, your section on that. So in terms of actually physically, you know, uh, measuring some of these elements when you're, you know, considering transactions at DBS, how, how, do, you, how do you really clarify that they, they are positively improving sustainability? So we, uh, when we try to do a transaction that we label as sustainable finance, it's not just the asset that we are financing that we will be evaluating how much mitigation that is going to enable. We also want to look at the company's overall performance and also when we talk about transition, um, we want to see where they are transitioning to, uh, what is their vision and also the timeline involved because we are aiming for peak emissions by 2030. So for us, I think, um, if I relate back to the earlier question posed to me, uh, what sort of um, reporting framework may be useful for people to know in companies' books that is uh, ESG material? Uh, I do think TCFD is a very good start. However, looking at many companies' so-called uh, TCFD report, they really do vary in breadth and depth. Um, the quality is very different. The metrics used are not consistent. And I think there is actually potential for uh, regulators to come in to say, actually, we only need a few capabilities material. It could be that we know that coal is one that will become stranded first. Uh, what is companies' coal exposure? Um, what is financial institutions' thermal coal exposure? And with that one KPI, already you see how embedded climate risk is. Rather than trying to do too much, um, at the same time, I do feel that with um, ESG reporting, sometimes it is good to zero in, to start small. Okay, thank you very much, Yolanda. I'm, I'm aware of the time. I just want to give DG Jessica uh, a chance to kind of share uh, her closing thoughts. And, and let me just uh, read out the couple of questions that came in for you. Uh, possibly, I know it's slightly out of your area, so you, so you may not have the details on this, but Essentially, the first one was how does BNM integrate climate bills specifically in foreign reserve management? Uh, and then a kind of related question is how do you incorporate the sustainability climate risk considerations in the credit operations role? And, and can you kind of expand a bit further on what factors are being considered around that? Okay. Um, thanks, Aziz. I'll just uh, take those together and I think I'll make two points um, and some have uh, other speakers have already alluded to it. There are two, two game changers, if you like, if I can call them that, that we believe uh, are really going to move this agenda forward. One is uh, the taxonomy, which is, which is what we have uh, published and we want to finalize very soon. Um, and that's because that will help us to be able to um, identify climate risk exposures and um, you know, look at it in a more systematic way across the system. I think that then allows us to answer the question, well, how then do we calibrate our credit operations? Because until we know, you know what the implications of designing some of these uh, operations uh, with, with climate risk considerations in mind, until we, we have a better feel of the impact of that, um, it's, it could be quite difficult uh, um, you know, it, it can be done, but I think uh, we, we do run the risk of potential unintended consequences. Um, so that taxonomy is going to be very important for us to help size up the risk and allow us to then think more clearly about how we could redesign some of our central bank operations. Um, the second, uh, if you like, key enabler in our view is uh, what Yolanda alluded to, which is the disclosure. We, we do believe that um, on measuring these risks on the books of banks. Uh, initially, it's identifying, right, whether a particular activity or overall business is, is contributing to climate risk mitigation and adaptation. But over time as well, I mean, you know, once that 
initial original lending or investment decision is made, it is important to over time then uh, monitor how uh, that company operations has, in, has an impact on the environment or in climate. So disclosures will help to um, allow us to continue to monitor and assess those risks over time. Um, so I think those two things are, are really critical in our view as, um, as things that we really need to move forward uh, on in order to, uh, to help us kind of uh, uh, get more traction around this agenda. On in, uh, reserve management, uh, we do have um, targets that, that we set for um, uh, ESG investments and, um, you know, and we are building uh, frameworks for uh, scoring models as well as uh, measurement frameworks that will allow us to monitor our exposures uh, and, and the performance of these investments over time. So that is uh, definitely something that is incorporated and taken into account in our reserve management operations. And, and ESG is, is now an important theme in all our investment strategies uh, for both our equity and, and fixed income uh, investments as well. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, DJ Jessica. Um, there are plenty more questions and I'm sure we can carry on this discussion for uh, easily another half an hour or one hour, but I'm afraid we are out of time. Um, so we, we need to close it for today. But um, as part of this project, there will be an ongoing series of such webinars uh, uh, following on similar kind of themes. Uh, and we'll also be developing some policy briefs to act as guidance to central banks and and uh, financial authorities uh, on the back of this. So please do uh, keep, uh, you know, keep a lookout on the usual channels, on our websites, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, um, to, uh, so that you can join us for, for our future events and, and um, be notified when the publications are released. Um, I should also say, um, CSIN itself, we're, we're running uh, another session on the Sustainable and Responsible Investment Guide with the NGFS next week, and we're planning to run another training session on climate risk stress testing and scenario building with the NGFS and um, with the Bank of England, uh, hopefully. Uh, so please also keep posted for that because I think that will be an interesting session. And as one of the questions here was pointing out, we need you know additional help on, on setting out those transitional steps and how to get there. Uh, and and this, that's what we're very much trying to do with this project. So I'd like to thank uh, DG Jessica Chu again uh, to Yolanda Chung and to Ulrich Waltz for taking their time to join us on this webinar, sharing their thoughts and uh, helping to move this debate forward. Thank you all very much. And to all our participants, thank you very much for joining. And to everyone, please stay safe and tune in for the next one in the series. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aziz. And thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.